Hi, welcome. Thank you for watching our YouTube video. We're here with Mark Infield. Mark is a conservationist and an author, and we're talking today about his new book called Beautiful Beasts, Beautiful Lands, The Fall and Rise of an African National Park. Um, Mark's currently working as a conservation, uh, conserving Ashdown Forest, and he's been in conservation for 35 years. Welcome, welcome, and thank you for joining us today, Mark. Well, thanks very much for having me. Thanks so much. Um, so I, I've, I've read your book and I've, I've gone through certain sections of it, and um, I really love. Um, I've, I've got feel like I've gotten to know the Bahima people, and specifically these um, uh, Ankole cattle that I've got in the background that you can see here. So I placed it here as my background just to give our viewers an idea of what the area looks like and what the Ankole cattle looks like. But uh, I want to read a little bit of a description um, that you provided of the Ankole cattle. You described them as majestic animals with the elegant chestnut-colored hides and enormous crescent-shaped horns, horns, which seem to mirror the sweeping savanna they graze on. So, when you first arrived um, in Mburu National Park, uh, you noticed these cattle. Can you maybe just tell me a little bit about your journey up to that point when you arrived in Mburu National Park, your youth and your, your youthful dream of becoming a conservationist and how those opinions of conservation changed along the way? Well, I'll try. That's that's quite a long uh, kind of question with a lot of topics, but let, let me begin. So in the introduction, you mentioned um, that I work on Ashdown Forest, which is a really important but very small protected area in the UK, in southeast England. And I actually grew up on the edge of that area. It's a beautiful open heathland. And that, if you like, is where my first love of nature came from. And that influenced me. And it was a very emotional thing because I was a small child and I was in this wonderful place. So if if you like, that set me off on a journey. I, I studied zoology because I knew that that would be the right thing to do. And I just got myself to Africa. Um, I got on a plane and I flew to, to Kenya. And I knew absolutely nothing. I, I didn't know about nature conservation. I had a degree in zoology, but that was it. But the main thing that, that really I hadn't thought about at all was because I was going to Africa inspired by nature and the books and documentaries that I'd read as a child. So it was all about the wildlife for me. Elephants and lions and whatever you, you, know, you, you think typifies um, the splendors of, of wild Africa. The people I'd never thought about. I literally never thought about the fact that Africa was full of people. So in a way, when I arrived um, in Uganda and I had my first exposure to Lake Mburu, um, which was you know, going to be such a central part of my life over the next 35 years, and I encountered these incredible beasts, it was a total shock for me in a way because I just never thought about the people and their relationship to the land and the existence of creatures like this. And nobody had ever mentioned that I was going to see and coli cows. I was expecting to see elephants and lions and buffaloes, but this was a revelation. And it's been actually, in, in many ways, the Ancoli cow has created the, the various revelations that I've had during the course of my work as a conservationist and, and really influenced how I think about nature and people's relationships with it and, and therefore how we go about thinking about nature and its conservation. Fantastic. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Now, I, I can hear your passion shining through. So you, you start the book by talking about when you arrived, you saw the cattle and the people as part of nature, the way they were almost living in the natural areas, um, in the savanna with the rest of the wildlife that you've just mentioned, which you then yep. studied. You also mentioned that first flight that you as a very young conservationist that you took over the land that you s saw in um, Mburu National Park. Can you maybe describe that feeling and, 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 and also 
these cattle as part of the landscape and and how you saw it mm. it was an incredible piece of luck for me to find that first job um, in nature conservation i was a volunteer i just got myself there and you know within a couple of months of arriving in africa i was finding myself as part of this team of aerial survey uh, researchers so we had a, a pilot and we had um, a system and what we were actually going out to do was to see uganda had come through a really really difficult political economic and social time um, which had massive impact on every element of life in uganda but that included its wildlife and its protected areas so conserva international conservation organizations and uh, the uganda national parks if you like, wanted to see what was left. Um, was there anything left of, of the, the wildlife? And so we were doing aerial surveys, um, not over the national parks, because that had already been completed, but some of the other areas to see what wildlife was still out there. And Lake and Buru was the first area that we flew over where we saw anything in terms of wildlife. So that was exciting. We'd just seen empty savannas uh, up until then. When we got to Lake and Buru, for the first time, we were seeing wildlife underneath us. But what struck me, and it was quite a surprise, was that within those areas, within those populations of wildlife, it was clear that there was human activity going on. You could see the houses of the people I uh, learned were the Bahima people, and you could see the trails, and you could see the herds from the air of these cows. So that was a surprise to me but ironically or strangely what it did was reminded me of, of, of back home in the uk because my wildlife experiences my relationship with nature in the uk was in the context of a very mixed up kind of landscape we didn't have these big areas that people said that's for wildlife and over here this is where people live and farm it was all one everything the woods the fields the hedgerows the ponds the streams the gardens my mum's my garden that was all one landscape so it was all mixed up but the understanding yeah. that i absorbed in africa was no it would be very difficult national parks are national parks you don't have people you only have wildlife and, and, and tourists of course um so flying over in buru and looking down thinking wow this is this is great. Look, it's full of people, it's full of activity, it's also full of wildlife. So that, if you like, got my mind thinking in a slightly different way than conventional fe uh, fences and fortress type conservation had been thinking up until that point. Fantastic. And you, your book then goes into the historical aspect of, of the area and what happened before you actually arrived. Um, and, and, and it's a story about clashes and about power grabs and about power moving people out um, of hunters coming in from outside, not um, the Bahima people that, that have these cows as part of the landscape, but other people that actually came in to hunt, to fish and to use the resources. Do you want to maybe just, in short, explain that power struggle and as part of conservation what you then s saw when you did this research and meeting the people yeah well without going into too much detail because it is complicated inevitably this part of uganda for hundreds of years had been divided up into different kingdoms which were quite centrally organized and they competed with each other um, and some were stronger and some were weaker um, and within these groups there were different if you like economic groups so if we talk about the people that own these cows the behema owned these cows and you don't end up with a cow looking like this by accident you have to really really want something you have to really really work at it to end up with a creature as magnificent as this and so they were breeding selectively for hundreds of years for these beautiful creatures. Now, to breed something like that, there are sacrifices involved. 
So there were definitely production sacrifices. These are not the most productive animals in the world. Um, and that's partly because they said, no, well, we want to make sure we keep them because they're beautiful. Other people can go for more productive cows. We're going to keep these ones. But that focus on the beauty in some ways meant that they were so obsessional that other activities, farming, keeping of other kinds of livestock, fishing, those things that you mentioned, they couldn't really come into the area because the only way to be in that place was to be part of this this kind of mindset that focused on the beauty of the cows. So the cows and the landscape um, and the people all became one, if you like. Now that got incredibly uh, affected by the colonial impact um, imperialism came in it wanted to change everything and it forced people these people the behema to say no you've got to stop thinking about beauty you've got to start thinking about production you got to we want things to sell and trade and the behema said no we're not going to do it and that if you like is the origin of the conflict between the behema and conservation ever since because the behemoth say this land is for the beautiful cows and everybody else has been saying no it's for something else and that is the nature of the conflict uh, and it, is, it, is, it goes even deeper because i mean the behemoth uh, connects spiritual sort of religious values almost to these cows um and with foreigners or or, or other communities coming in telling them what to do it's very hard for them to to live with the, with with those instructions or or with those decisions no that's absolutely right so the behema um like many other peoples in this part of uganda trace their origins back to the mythical batwezi people so the batwezi are, are viewed as gods that lived on earth and the batwezi had these cows and loved them and the stories about their love of the cows are a big part of the mythology uh, of the area so when the betrezi gave the behemoth these cows and said okay we're going you won't see us anymore so you've got to look after the cows that became central to the identity of the behemoth people and the production uh, of, of beautiful herds like the one that we're looking at before behind you that's how you defined yourself as as a, a, a good um, person, a person that's meeting what uh, a muhima uh, should should do in their lives, have and look after these beautiful creatures because they were given to them by the gods. Wow. And so any hmm. interfered with that had to be kind of resisted. And there are different ways that the, the behema found to resist and, and continue to find to resist. Wow, that's, that's almost like uh, preservation or conservation stewardship approach in itself. Look after these cows almost like you would look after the environment. And I think that's probably where we can start talking about your, your, your ideas on conservation versus preservation um, and how the use of the land by the community and the people is sometimes in conflict with the legal aspects of the land is owned by and, and the land is exclusionary to these people. Can you maybe just um, give us a little bit about your ideas on conservation versus preservation and your concepts of wilderness that we spoke about a little bit earlier? Sure. Uh, and again, this is quite a complex area of, of, of conversation uh, overlapping ideas but this this ideal of the national park the national park ideal that has swept the world um comes to us through modern conservation from the you know, middle late 19th century in the united states of america so that's where the first national park was created yellowstone national park and we talk about the yellowstone model and I still find it difficult to understand. I, 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 I've done research, so I, can, I think I can see where it evolved from, the thinking where it evolved from. But it still seems crazy to me that we try and talk about 
nature conservation saying we need people to be interested in nature we want people to support our protected areas we want to you know get these connections real and living but the main thing that we understand of a national park is it's got a hard edge and nobody's allowed inside it unless you're a paying tourist or a scientist as it were so we say we want these connections but the first act we do when we create these areas is we start cutting the connections away and we're saying you know no this is for wildlife this is not anything that any of you uh, can have a place in and that seems mad to me um now the reasons for that are in part this idea of wilderness and, and that is i think personally embedded so deeply in the, the ideal of the national park it's become almost the ideal of nature conservation is that we're trying to keep wilderness and wilderness is defined really as a place that has no human um, connection no human impact humans were never there you can't see and you don't want to see signs of humanity now that's a kind of myth in itself because everywhere certainly everywhere in africa but everywhere in the world has the impress of human hands so everywhere to my mind is actually a cultural landscape the opposite of wilderness so inevitably if you have this idea of wilderness that means no people, no human engagement. And so we end up with this kind of rhetoric around nature conservation that's very difficult to manage. Um, no people, unless you're here just, you know, as a, as a paying tourist or some something with a quite abstracted view, not a deep emotional connection to the place. And for me, that is one of the key things that we have to rethink in modern conservation, that the concept of wilderness is is a is a false one in my view and we need to think of of all of lands including the ones that we protect as cultural landscapes and we need to understand their power um, in those connections with people most particularly the people that that were there originally or are still there and have these these deep connections with the place so if we're talking about lake and brew the most obvious uh, example to look at and to get thinking about is the Bahima, their beautiful special Ancoli cows and the landscape in, in which they always were. How do you rethink the concept of a national park in the context of wanting to understand and encourage and rebuild those relationships? Fantastic. I mean, uh, talking about cultural landscapes um, in South Africa, we've got we've had a very similar sort of historical perspective with the establishment, for example, of our most popular uh, park, the Kruger National Park, was also an exclusionary model where people were excluded, moved to the edges of it. Um, recently there's been some court cases that uh, communities have won and areas of the national park has been given back to communities with agreements that they would keep it as part of the national park but there, there's some use use models for the communities and getting involvement in in, in management of the areas etc what do you think is the answer for these type of situations to to reincorporate cultural landscapes in the our national parks etc so when when lake and Buru national park was created in in 1983 um uh, immediately if, if you put the categorization of national park there all the laws kick in and they say well what's the law about a national park oh well there can't be any people so immediately you gazette a place you you end up having to 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 undertake historically at any rate these these really awful actions of booting people out clearing the area causing enormous um uh, you know un unhappiness isn't the word real loss and often uh, in some cases loss of life and livelihood so that's what happened to lake and Buru. 
And as soon as it was possible, um, because of a change of government, the people came back in and said, we're not ever going to allow this to happen again. Um, so we, we're going to destroy it, which they did in a way. And the wildlife was hunted out and, and um, it, that was the expe expectation that would be the end of that national park. And it's very easy to understand why that was the case. Now, with, with various kinds of support and work, we were able to keep some part of that land for nature conservation. So the current park is about one third of the original area. And it's entailed a lot of discussion, a lot of negotiation, a lot of thinking about, OK, how do we restructure that relationship with communities? Now, one of the most important things that I think I learned was that we tried to create a set of economic relationships between those people and that protected area. And those are important. You can't ignore them. And the example that you were talking about in, in Kruger, that includes access to resources and shares in the tourism industry and the, the flow of benefits from the protected area or the conservation activity to communities so that they can share in the benefits. That's really, really important. But in most places, it's not enough. It doesn't work very well. And whilst we focused on all of those thinkings that the primary interest of people in nature is an economic one to the exclusion of any other interests what we were ignoring is this whole set of connections and values that come from their historical and ongoing cultural connections to these areas so when you talk about resource access using things that are in these protected areas yes some element of that you can think of in economic terms there is a value in the, the the meat that's taken or the reeds that are harvested but the actual acts of doing those activities those are cultural and people are often very very attached to them so actually um, i often think about um, protected areas in south africa where hunting was was banned that's kind of normal and the communities were really really keen to have access to those those animals but they weren't i think thinking about that primarily in economic terms they wanted the cultural act of acting and how that created relationships between the chiefs and the warriors that was very important so by allowing hunting you would restructure those cultural relationships it wouldn't be an economic activity so at lake and Buru, when we were talking about trying to find a way to bring these incredible Ancoli cows into the management of the park, we talked about economic cows and cultural cows. And we tried to make a distinction to say, yeah, if you open up Lake and Brew, which is quite a small area, to economic cows, and that the justification for doing that is economic benefit, the park will be buried in cows it will just not be able to manage nature conservation and if you like commercial cattle raising but if you think about and you can look at those cows behind you if you think about those in cultural terms you can say well let's let's only talk about cultural cows and let's find a way to bring all of the cultural values and connections between the people and the cows and the landscape into the park by bringing these cows in for cultural reasons and that allows you to think about the the practice in a very different way and and manage it in a different way you don't need ten thousand cows to meet the cultural objective a thousand cows will meet the cultural objective and that allows you to to manage it in, in a different way that that if you like doesn't threaten the 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 future activities which uncontrolled economic activities probably would i like that i like the distinction between the cultural cow and the um the economic cow you know because i mean globally we can see that this is part of the problem you know where we've created these major farms that destroy ecosystems that that are purely focused on economic benefit um, to raise cows in many in many areas, not in a 
grassland, but but even bring in feed or various things. So by calling them a cultural cow and re-establishing their connection to the land, one might bring in some of these um, solutions. So for future conservationists, young guys that are getting into the conservation field now, what advice would you give them on integrating these cultural norms, communities in various aspects? I mean, we hear about communities in the Amazon, about how their traditional values have looked after the land and 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 conserved the land. We we know we've heard about the American traditional people also looking after the land um, in cultural in their cultural heritage. How would you advise new conservationists coming in to to meet their biodiversity objectives, but also ultimately bringing the cultural values into the model? Another complicated area of thinking. <laughs> um, I, I'm a great believer. I do believe in the need for protected areas. I, I don't think um, the national park model is a good one, but protected areas I think are really, really important. That doesn't mean uh, that we that we should ignore the production lands and and in many you know in the UK now, for example, we're we're having to rethink our entire landscape. Um, so that we can have nature recovery, and, and we're talking about rewilding and, and many other uh, activities. And interestingly enough, livestock, um, cattle in particular, is playing an increasingly important role in delivering conservation outcomes in the UK. And we have this, this concept of conservation grazing. So on Ashdown Forest, where I, I now work, um, that is one of the most important tools that we're trying to design and implement um, so that we can have cattle and other uh, animals, ponies and, and sheep, grazing the heathland, which is this very critical habitat, because they are the main tool by which we can um, preserve that, that, that landscape and, and, and the biodiversity associated with it. Um, that's a, a slight aside, but an important aside. But if, if, if I'm going to talk about, go back to what I was talking about, protected areas, and at the moment, you know, we're talking about we need to protect one third of the surface of the land and the seas. Um, to some extent, you know, I can say, well, that's a great ambition. Um, although part of me says, well, look, we're struggling to actually effectively manage the 10 to 15 percent we got at the moment. So just having more doesn't help. What we need to do is really think more carefully about how we protect protected areas and for me a big and it goes back to the question you ask a big part of that is what i have learned to call governance you know, how do you make decisions about what those areas are and what they're delivering and how they're delivering them who is part of that decision making process and i was looking um uh, at something i wrote many years ago um where i was talking about actually one of the most important things that we need to share when we talk about protected areas is not only the resources and not only the benefits but it's also sharing the right to say what is the meaning of these places what are they actually protecting and what's interesting about this is that if if, if we're a group of, of interested parties, me and you and others, you know, I, I can have my thinking about what's important in this area. So if we're talking about Lake and Buru, I can say, you know, I love the, the zebras. I, I want the zebras to be there. And the behemoth can say, well, we don't have any, you know, problem with the zebras, but it's not that important to us. What's important to us is a place for our Ancoli cows. So then we can say, all right, well, we're both then talking about a place that we want to protect. And both of the things that we want to protect can be there at the same time. So we can have layers. You are doing it for the things that interest you. And I'm doing it for the things that interest me. 
And that's absolutely fine because we're both pursuing the same objective, a protected area, but for entirely different reasons. So for me, that, if you like, um, is an important idea uh, for the future of protected areas that we can, as groups, design them to deliver a whole range of values that, that, that we are not collectively interested in, but as, as a group, we find ways to, to layer and compromise. Nobody gets 100%, but we all get ultimately the thing that we, we're interested in. Fantastic. And I'm, I'm very glad you brought in the, uh, the concept of uh, protecting 30% or a third of the land and with the, the way the global ideas and signatories for biodiversity on protection, um, South Africa is also a country that has signed for 30% of land to be conserved and protected. So when, what do you see? So you covered some of the ideas. What do you see the future of these protected areas? It might exacerbate a lot of these issues that you have mentioned that you've discovered with cultures being excluded. I think maybe touch on that. But one other thing I would also in our final couple of minutes talk about is the tourism value of these cultures because protecting these areas bring in tourism revenue and as we've seen in COVID in Africa what happened was many of these communities suffered because they couldn't have any tourists coming through so conservation areas suffered People wanted to get rid of the conservation areas because now they didn't have economic value anymore. Tourists weren't coming anymore. So ultimately, I think there's a tourism value also, for example, in these Nkole cows. So do you think regulations should change with these protected areas in the future to enable us to get a third of the land protected? Well, as I said, I, I have concerns about um, 30 by 30. That's what my government in the UK has signed up to as well. 30% of the land conserved by 2030. What is meant by protected and conserved is, is, is unclear. And it, it, in the UK, for sure, we're going to be looking at our, our production landscapes uh, to manage them in such a way that we can have recovery of nature within them um, and that nature can flow through productive landscapes um, from areas that are managed more primarily for nature conservation. So issues of connectivity um, and corridors um, and, and, and partnerships is, is really, really important. Um, and I think that is the case everywhere. The idea that we can set aside a third um, of the of the land and sea area for exclusionary protected areas um, is clearly not uh, a goer and, and I would hate to see it because that almost certainly would result in, in what you referred to as, as people being excluded from lands and having their their connection severed and their rights uh, removed. I don't think anybody is thinking in that way so I think we have moved on as a, as a conservation community and we understand that we have to have integrated land uses and we have to think about um, connectivity and, and larger landscapes. But as I said, for me, protected areas um, at whatever uh, level and however you think about them are, are a really important part of that mix. And that's partly um, because, you know, coming back to the, the, the last bit of your question, that's partly because tourism of various kinds really is important. I mean, there are challenges with it because of international travel and, and, and climate change and all the rest. But nonetheless, uh, we, and I referenced this earlier in our conversation, we, we can't ignore economic realities. We have to respond to the fact that people need to earn livelihoods and the land is the basis of many livelihoods and will continue to be that. So 
one of the things that, that we tried to do in thinking about the Ancoli cows on Lake and Buru was that we actually set up um, a thing called the Beautiful Cow Conservation Center. And so what we were saying is that by thinking about Lake and Buru National Park in a different way, by integrating the values of these incredible Ancoli cows into the national park, you not only change the the kind of the nature of the protected area but you create opportunities and there we saw real opportunities for international tourism and the center if you like was to to provide opportunities for international tourists to come and exp and learn about the history of the ancoli cow um so if you like it's another attraction of the national park but it was also very much to say look the future of the behemoth, the future of these cows is changing, like everything's changing. Fewer and fewer behemoth are able to keep these cows because, as we said, they're not that productive. So in the future, for the behemoth people, the place that they would come to learn about their cultural uh, past, where they would come to learn about what was special about them and, and, and their connection to these cows, that would be a protected area. Um, so you can think of tourism um, in various different ways and so if you have people coming um, for whatever reasons then that creates opportunities for livelihoods and economic uh, kind of flows as well. Fantastic so um, I, I just thought about it as well this image I got from TripAdvisor so which shows you there's already some interest from international tourists in these Ancoli cattle. And I think that brings us to the end and, 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 and brings a nice way in which you describe the beauty of these cattle to back to your book's title, Beautiful Beasts, Beautiful Land. And it seems like this behemoth people are so invested in the beauty of things which works with tourism. Um, so thank you very much for watching this video so and thank you very much for joining me um mark so for the people watching uh please remember to like and subscribe there's the at the bottom i will include a link to the book um beautiful beast beautiful lands the fall and rise of the african national park uh, mark's book so please uh, click on it and uh, read the article on our wish website conservation mag Dot org. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure.